Hey, this is Jacob from MotionVFX.com, and today we'll dig into our latest plugin called M Volumetric. Of course, both Motion and Final Cut Pro X already include a light rays filter, which is supposed to generate a volumetric like effect, but playing with it reveals a lot of limitations. Moving its center near or outside the edges of your viewer generates sampling artifacts, which you can see right here. You also need to use additional filters or masks to cast light rays only from the brightest areas on the screen, which is kind of a pain to set up, especially in FCPX, and it doesn't look right either. You can actually see that it's based on a simple zoom blur. But most importantly, this is a post-processing effect, which means that its results are based entirely on what you can see in your clip. Because of this, you can't, for example, create a light beam that is being cast from outside of the frame. As soon as the bright parts move off the screen, the effect fades. Now let's compare it with M Volumetric. We could start with one of the animated templates included with M Volumetric. It comes with 15 generators, 5 titles, 5 transitions, and 5 effects. All of them beautifully done by our talented designer team. I'm going to take the basic project instead. This way we'll have access to all of the plugin settings. In general, M Volumetric is based on two main elements, casters and occluders. And they do exactly what their names suggest. Casters cast our light rays and occluders dim or block them completely. As you can see, we can have one caster and up to two occluders per scene. But don't worry, most of the time using the caster alone or with a single occluder will be enough. Alright, we can see our light rays already, but they are being cast from our default image, so let's pick something more interesting by clicking on the caster source, selecting my texture from the event browser, and hitting apply clip. Of course you can use video clips as well, it doesn't have to be a still image. Okay, I can see that it got cropped along the way, so let's scale the drop zone source down a bit. Yeah, much better. So, these icons are our on-screen controls. We've spent a lot of time developing them to make sure that setting up your scene is as quick and as easy as possible. Of course all of them are linked with actual parameters within the inspectors, so you can animate them as you like. Our famous camera controls are also here, so let's rotate it a bit, and the plugin reacts as expected. I can even move the camera away from my caster and still see the light rays. You've probably noticed that M Volumetric doesn't run as fast as Apple's light rays filter. That's pretty obvious since our plugin uses a much more powerful algorithm, but you can speed it up yourself by preventing Final Cut from generating clip previews on your timeline. To do this, just go down to the Clip Appearance settings and pick the option without any previews. See the difference? On. and off again. Free performance. Neat, right? Now let's dig a bit deeper into light settings. First I'm going to zoom out a bit to see our on-screen controls better. By the way, you can double-click on these buttons to reset your camera's position, and holding shift while dragging increases their speed so you don't have to click and drag your mouse a dozen times just to move it. As you can see, it works much faster. Of course we've had a better solution for this, but after the last Final Cut update, it no longer works. Anyway, this pyramid is where our volumetric light is being generated. I've mentioned before that casters cast our light rays, and while this is true, the actual 3D light's position is represented by the top of this pyramid. The light travels forward and passes through the bright areas of your caster texture while being blocked by the dark ones. So the caster is more like a portal through which our light is being cast. You can even see that moving the light position icon affects the pyramid accordingly. The next parameter on the list is called Fade Type, and it allows you to switch between different fading methods. We recommend staying with the natural type as it produces most organic results, but you may want to use constant depending on the effect that you're looking for. The intensity slider of course sets the light's intensity, so no surprises there. Spread on the other hand defines how wide or narrow your light rays are going to be, and you can control it either by using this slider, or by grabbing and resizing the blue frame at the bottom of our pyramid. Just remember that this also affects our 3D light's position. 
fade amount controls how fast your light is going to fade. You can make it longer or shorter and it can also be changed using the on-screen controls. Just click on the green frame and move it closer or away from the caster. Fade offset may seem a bit weird at first, but since we already know how the plugin works, it shouldn't be too hard to understand. As I mentioned before, the actual light is located here at the top of our pyramid, so it also fades from this exact point. But say you don't want it to fade like that. You want it to fade from the caster instead of the light's 3D position. Well, that's what this parameter is for. It offsets the starting point of the fade effect. So setting this at zero will cause the light to fade from the top of the pyramid and increasing this value will move it closer to the caster. In theory, the maximum value is 100, which will cause the light to fade exactly from the caster's position, but you can bring it even further and achieve some interesting results. The range setting is pretty much the maximum length of your light rays, so changing it, also using its icon at the bottom of our pyramid, will simply trim or reveal them, but note that setting this parameter too high will increase the amount of calculations performed by the plugin, so try to keep it as low as you can. The last option from the light settings group is called Color Override. It will cause M volumetric to replace the ray's colors with a custom one. You can also use the color offset slider to create a gradient between the picked color and the ones generated from your caster. Alright, now let's see how we can set up and control our caster within our scene. The caster is a two-dimensional texture located in 3D space. Of course we need to be able to use our own textures, so it had to be based on Motion's drop zones. The problem is that due to one of Motion's and Final Cut's updates, you may experience cropping issues, but no worries, we've included a couple of the drop zone source settings so you can scale and pan them if needed. Just note that they are only meant for preparing your texture. We'll cover the animation process in just a second. The actual caster settings are gathered within the caster group, so let's unfold it and see what's inside. First is this visible checkbox, which basically hides the caster's texture. It can be useful if your project requires you to render just the light rays. Next are the position, rotation and scale settings. These are the ones you need to keyframe if you wish to animate the caster's transformation. Of course you can control the former two using the on-screen controls, but remember that the 3D light also depends on these settings so moving and rotating the caster will affect its position as well. At the bottom of the caster group you'll find the threshold and tolerance parameters. You can use them to cast light rays only from the really bright areas of your footage. Threshold defines how bright the pixel is supposed to be, and Tolerance smooths the end result to avoid harsh edges. Occluders are also 2D planes in 3D space, and they are disabled by default, so to turn one on, you need to click on this grey square next to its name. Once it lights up, the occluder becomes active. Picking and adjusting a custom texture works exactly the same as before. Click on the occluder1 source icon, Pick your footage from the event browser, hit apply clip and adjust the drop zone settings if needed. Inside the occluder 1 group we can see the same visible position, rotation and scale settings, but if you want to manipulate your occluder directly within the viewport, just select it in the inspector and the proper on-screen controls will become active. You may have noticed that we've got two additional settings here. Enabling the use luma mode will read the occluder's pixels and generate alpha channel based on their brightness. So the brighter the pixel, the less transparent it will be. Choosing the inverted mode will cause it to work the other way around. The opacity setting on the other hand controls the occluder's overall transparency. And here's the neat part. Decreasing it won't just dim the occluder on your render. You see, the way light works in real life is that it's actually made from multiple waves of light. Lengths of these waves represent what we perceive as color. So by shining a completely white light through a piece of red glass, you're actually filtering out all of its wavelengths except for the ones we describe as red. M volumetric works the same way. It's aware of the pixel's transparency and filters out colors that shouldn't be there. As a matter of fact, it's the first real-time renderer in the world that can do that. M volumetric has been optimized to fit most situations while retaining an interactive preview, but there are times when you just need to crank your renders up a notch. The quality settings are meant exactly for such situations. Since this is a ray tracing engine, you need to have samples. 
Basically, if you start to see specific patterns in your light rays, you may want to choose a higher preset or just go nuts, pick the custom mode and boost them to 500 or even 1000 samples per pixel. Luckily, increasing this value doesn't slow down your rendering that much, so feel free to play with them until you achieve a smooth ray of light. The resolution setting is a totally different story though. It will remove all aliasing artifacts that may show up in some specific situations, but it will affect your rendering speed, so most of the time you'll be better off leaving it at its default setting. The blur amount can be used to hide any unwanted sampling and aliasing artifacts, but note that this will also blur your caster, so be careful, don't overdo it, and increase the samples count if needed. The Hide OSC checkbox is a quick and easy way to disable on-screen controls that may interfere with your preview. The camera controls, on the other hand, allow you to animate the scene's camera. All you need to do is create keyframes for its position and rotation, move the timeline playhead forward, reposition the camera using the on-screen controls, and voila! A camera going around fully three-dimensional light shafts. M-Volumetric isn't just for Final Cut Pro X users. As a matter of fact, we've always said that if you want to create more complex scenes, you have to go into motion. As usual, things are much easier to do here. Just import and volumetric from Motion's library, add a 3D camera and start playing. Of course, you can still use the same on-screen controls as before. To bring them up, either switch to the Adjust tool or right-click on the generator and pick Control from the list. Using the inspector here is cleaner and much more intuitive as well. Only parameters for the currently selected object are visible, so you don't have to go through the entire list as in Final Cut. Even their texture sources are grouped together with the rest of their settings, and you don't need to use Motion's drop zones anymore. Just drag your clips or even entire groups directly onto these image references and you're done. By the way, if you're dropping a group here, make sure that it's set to 2D and that it has the fixed resolution setting enabled. This way you'll avoid a couple of potential issues. Ok, but in Final Cut we were able to speed up our rendering by disabling the timeline previews. While we can't do the same thing here, we can simply deselect our generator and the rendering will speed up as well. This is caused by the fact that Motion spends a lot of time refreshing the interface instead of utilizing our resources for rendering. Luckily we found the mention fix, so you can squeeze every last drop of your GPU's computing power. As you can see, M-Volumetric can help you create anything from heavy god rays and shining texts to grading overlays and really delicate touches. And of course we're releasing a demo version as well, so be sure to check it out and thanks for your time.